to introduce uh, Carl to the stage. He's a researcher up at UW. He's been a friend of ours for a long time, spoken at a couple of tour cons. So please welcome him to the tour con stage. All right, thank you. So uh, today I'm going to talk about a third-party service I built called uh, TLS MyNet, uh, which allows you to enable HTTPS for home network devices uh, through the standard Let's Encrypt service. And this, sound, this might sound to you like uh, a pretty uninteresting talk. Uh, it's like, okay, it's how, how you use Let's Encrypt, blah, blah, blah. But there's uh, actually a bunch of issues in particular with local network devices that make it hard to use and also reasons why you might want to use HTTPS or TLS on your, on your home network. Uh, so a uh, question that I get, uh, let's see, let me start this here. Okay. Uh, so a question that I get commonly asked is, all right, so why do you need TLS on your home network? You already have WPA, WPA2 on your wireless network. Isn't that enough encryption for you? So it turns out that browsers are starting to require TLS for what they consider powerful APIs. Uh, and so this can mean making, uh, you know, using things like uh, requesting permission to access the camera or the microphone or using certain uh, permissions or capabilities that uh, you would not want a compromised website to be able to have. And so you might want to build a web app that uses these powerful APIs, but you might also want them to talk to local network devices. And the problem is that you can't make cross-origin requests from insecure sites uh, to, or from HTTPS sites to HTTP sites. And so uh, you really can't make these web apps that, or these secure web apps that talk to local devices. And in particular, the issue that came up for me, which caused me to think about this whole thing, was uh, I was uh, writing an app uh, for a Chromecast that would talk to a local network tuner on your network uh, and then show the uh, a current uh, over-the-air channel on your Chromecast. So Chromecast requires its applications to be delivered over HTTPS. Uh, the HD Home Run Tuner in particular does not support HTTPS, and so, uh, in fact, this is uh, impossible to build currently. And so I was uh, trying to figure out, you know, why doesn't it support HTTPS? Uh, how can we get them to support HTTPS? Uh, and it turns out that there's a lot of issues for enabling TLS on, on local devices. So the first one is that these local devices are often discovered by IP. So in the HD home run case, uh, the HD home run device actually connects out to their cloud service and says, hey, this is my local device. When you want to find a HD home run device, you connect out to the same cloud service. Uh, and since you're natted through the same IP, it can say what the local IP addresses are of the uh, devices on the same uh, sort of natted external IP is. And so you can discover internal devices that way. Uh, there's a bunch of other different ways of discovering local devices by IP address, but in general, uh, you only have an IP address and not a host name, and certificates are generally issued uh, for host names right now. Uh, and they're certainly not uh, going to be issued for uh, uh, internal IP addresses. So you might propose solving this solution by uh, just issuing a certificate. Uh, that is common across all devices. So let's say all these tuners have uh, one common certificate, and you connect to that. Uh, unfortunately, this is uh, easily abused. Uh, so you might remember the Superfish fiasco uh, from several years ago on um, Lenovo laptops. Uh, where basically there was one static uh, public-private uh, key pair that was shipped, and once you have the private key, then you can uh, impersonate uh, the service or the cert um, to any other device that, that trusts that public key. 
And similarly, even if you were to create a unique cert for each device, uh, some manufacturers like to use a uh, constant host name for each device. So you might have like uh, routerlogin.com, for example, and each device might have its own certificate for routerlogin.com. Uh, and the problem there is that if you have one device for routerlogin.com, then you can impersonate routerlogin on a different network uh, with a different device. Uh, and one of the one of the issues of like using uh, Let's Encrypt to sort of solve this uh, by automatically creating these certificates locally is that end users typically don't have their own domain name, and even if they do these local devices usually aren't externally facing uh, or they're not passed through the, uh, forwarded through the NAT. So uh, standard tools like Let's Encrypt and the standard CertBot doesn't really work for uh, creating the certificates for these devices. But it turns out that there's one company that has actually solved this issue and that company is Plex. And so here's how Plex has solved it. And uh, by the way, if you're not familiar with Plex, Plex is basically uh, your own private Netflix. Uh, so you set up your own Plex server, you, you load your own media onto it, uh, and then you can give access to it to your friends, and they can access it remotely over the internet and locally on your network. And it's all secured by HTTPS and TLS, and they've basically figured this out and made it work. So here's how they did that. Each server has a 16-byte GUID, and they issue a, a wildcard certificate to your server for that GUID.plex.direct. And then when you want to connect to a Plex server by IP address, you go to that IP address dot the server GUID dot Plex dot direct. And then in the background, they will, uh, they have a DNS server that resolves that IP address dot dot plex dot direct to just that IP address. And this allows for dynamic IP addresses, uh, both uh, exposed through NATs onto the internet and also for local IPs. So it would be nice to use a Plexus solution uh, just off the shelf as it is. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, the way that they actually implemented this is they partnered with a uh, certificate authority to issue these certificates. Uh, and they, I believe they ended up actually paying some money to this certificate authority to make this work. And most IoT vendors aren't going to spend any amount of money to increase security whatsoever. And so I thought, well, hmm, can we sort of emulate this with Let's Encrypt? And well, this is what that talk is about. So before I get into the details about how we make this work, I'll uh, quickly mention how Let's Encrypt issues certificates. It uses this protocol called the Automated Certificate Management Environment called uh, ECMI protocol. Uh, and this is implemented by CertBot and their uh, uh, CA site software called Boulder, along with some uh, third-party clients as well. Uh, and it basically does automated domain validation. So these are only uh, domain validated certificates. And the way that this works is that the CA issues challenges to pr prove uh, that you have control over the domain that you claim you have control over. And so there's two main challenges that are used right now. Uh, there are some that used to exist and some that are coming later, but the main two challenges right now are HTTP01, which is uh, please create a file at this specific URL with specific contents. And the second one is please add a text record uh, with specific, uh, specific contents uh, onto this domain. Uh, and the DNS01 challenge is the only way that you can actually get wildcard certificates. So Let's Encrypt has uh, this uh, idea of accounts. Uh, and accounts are basically tied to a private, uh, public-private key pair. And the public key is essentially your account ID. Now, for performance reasons, they actually have a integer account ID, but uh, basically you can go from a public key to your account ID. Um, and then the 
if you want to renew your certificate uh, or do anything else with your account, basically you just uh, re-sign these requests with your public key saying, hey, that account that I registered with the uh, key that I created before, uh, I'm the same person, so let me please do this again. So the solution that I'm proposing here is a service called uh, TLS MyNet, which uh, lets you issue a wildcard uh, search for subdomains, uh, where the subdomain name is tied to your Let's Encount uh, public key. And so uh, tying the, uh, the account or the subdomain name to your account key lets you verify the legitimacy of the uh, certificate at an application level. We can't guarantee that, uh, say, if you go to any TLS MyNet uh, site that it will be uh, your server that you're talking to, but if you go to your uh, uh, certificate or public key fingerprint.tlsmy.net, then you are talking to one of your machines. And so the way that we're going to use this is we're going to use uh, Let's Encrypt and CertBot uh, as normal, but we're going to prove ownership of uh, the private key of your uh, Let's Encrypt account to a third-party domain uh, for subdomain validation through a text record. And this is what TLS MyNet does. So the way that this works is a device initiates a subdomain wildcard certificate request to Let's Encrypt through CertBot. Uh, the, the device sends this challenge request to, uh, and then, so when it contacts Let's Encrypt, uh, Let's Encrypt responds back with a challenge to say, please prove ownership of this or control of this subdomain. So then the device sends this challenge request back to TLS MyNet. And this request is signed with the same Let's Encrypt private key uh, using uh, JWS. And the thumbprint of the public uh, or the corresponding public key is used as the subdomain of TLS MyNet, uh, my.net. So you can't actually request uh, certs for uh, a different account. And the way that this works is it's just a base 36 encoding of a two, SHA-256 hash of a particular way of hashing um, public keys. And so there are a couple of ways. Uh, so the way that this ends up being implemented is with uh, a couple of Python scripts. So there's uh, DNS server.py, which resolves a.b.c.d.thumbprint.tlsmy.net to a.b.c.d. And this um, allows you to basically use a host name instead of an IP address. And because it's a wildcard certificate, uh, the uh, TLS stack will accept that as a match and say that the certificate works. Uh, the second thing that it does is it provides these text records for uh, subdomain uh, verification. So when you send a challenge to us, we will add a text record for uh, thumbprint.tlsmy.net so that we can get a, a, um, a wildcard cert for that. And the way that you submit these requests uh, or these challenge requests uh, to us is through this web server, uh, which is just another Python script, uh, which handles these requests for creating these text records. Uh, it's implemented with async IO, AIO, HTTP, and JW crypto modules. Um, and uh, we also have a Redis server that sort of connects the, the two scripts together. So when we receive a valid request through the web server, we create a temporary text record um, in this Redis store that the DNS server can then access. And the nice thing about this is that this can be completely stateless. Um, because you are proving control over a particular or a, a particular public key, uh, by proving knowledge of the corresponding private key, uh, we don't actually have to create any accounts for you. Um, we just know that you are, uh, you have uh, control over the uh, subdomain that corresponds to the hash of your uh, Let's Encrypt uh, account ID. And so basically we don't have to do any long-term uh, state. Uh, storage. 
Uh, so it makes it very lightweight to, uh, to run. Um, on the client side, there are two more Python scripts. Uh, so one is called get domain, which basically just uh, looks at your Let's Encrypt config files and comes up with a particular domain name that you will use or that you will request. And then there's also a, uh, a retrieve challenge uh, Python script, which is uh, designed specifically to work with CertBot uh, as a manual authentication hook. And it communicates through environment variables. It receives uh, the particular, um, so it receives the domain that you want to authenticate for. It receives the challenge token that Let's Encrypt gives you that you need to add it as the text record. Uh, and then it takes those and uses your Let's Encrypt uh, account private key to sign those and send that off to uh, TLS MyNet. Uh, and I don't see anyone out with their laptops. Uh, I will say you, you can follow along if you want, but you know it's probably too late. But if you want to try this later, you can just go to tlsmy.net, and uh, that will redirect you to my GitHub repo. Just read the uh, instructions and the README, and it's basically as simple as this. So you set up this environment by basically cloning my repo. Uh, and uh, setting up a local uh, directory for your Let's Encrypt uh, account information so you don't have to be root or anything. Uh, you'll create uh, a Let's Encrypt account yourself so it will automatically generate this public private key locally and store it in your uh, home directory. Uh, there is, uh, you need to tell this, uh, these scripts what account private key you want to use to sign all of these challenges. Uh, and assuming you only have one account, you can just use this uh, simple uh, shell script one-liner to say, hey, just give me uh, the, the first private key file that you find in this Let's Encrypt home directory. And then you run certbot with this mess here, which basically says, use the uh, Let's Encrypt configuration in my home directory. Um, I want to only request a certificate, not reconfigure the server or do anything. I want to do it manually, but the way that I want to do it manually is to use this, um, this uh, manual uh, authentication hook script, and then the domain uh, I'm going to get from another Python script. And so uh, I did this on the plane last night, and uh, it still works, so hooray for that. Um, so if all works well, you should get your new certificates in uh, uh, some files in your home directory in .let's encrypt slash live slash uh, your thumbprint.tlsmy.net. So then you can take those certificate and your private key files, and you can copy those to your uh, home network devices. And then basically you're done. Uh, now they're only good for val they're only valid for 90 days, uh, so don't forget to update those every 90 days or so. Uh, so briefly, I'm going to talk about sort of the risk model here because uh, you know, might be thinking, well, now you can like this guy up here can now impersonate anything, and that is true. Um, so. <laughs> um, Basically, the, the third-party domain service, tlsmy.net, in, in this particular example, is assumed to be trusted because they can always issue certs for your subdomain. Uh, but sort of the way that I envision this going forward uh, in several instances is that sort of each device manufacturer might have their own uh, domain that they use for this, and you sort of trust that manufacturer anyway, uh, so maybe you should trust them. I don't know. But even if you don't, there's this cool feature called uh, certificate transparency uh, where you can search these certificate transparency logs to ensure that uh, no certs have been uh, issued for your subdomain uh, that you weren't aware of. So for example, uh, this is uh, my home network. Um, 
subdomain here. Uh, I searched for it uh, on CRT.sh, and it shows that it's been issued twice, uh, once in September and once you know, on the plane last night. Uh, and then you can go in there and see if it's been revoked. And uh, further down, you can check that the public key matches what you expect it to be, and that the hash uh, matches, and uh, everything is good and kosher. Um, so right now, TLSMI.net is sort of a public service. It's, uh, it's not getting a whole lot of use at the moment. Uh, it's currently limited to 50 certificates per week because Let's Encrypt assumes that I have control over the whole TLSMI.net domain. So if I'm getting all of these certificates, why don't I just get a wildcard certificate for the whole thing? However, uh, I've engaged them on the, the forums, and they said, yes, this is actually a legitimate use of Let's Encrypt. Uh, and so like, if uh, usage gets up to the point where uh, rate limits become an issue, we can probably whitelist that or uh, add you to the uh, public suffix list or things like that. Ultimately, I would like to see uh, Let's Encrypt uh, do some sort of version of this natively. Uh, and maybe this will prod them in, into uh, that sort of direction. Um, but for now, I sort of see this as a proof of concept service to uh, encourage TLS adoption. Um, and it makes it really easy. So please bug your IoT vendors to, uh, to support TLS because it's becoming an increasingly important to support. Uh, so. In summary, going forward, uh, TLS support is essential for all of these innovative web applications, uh, but there are a bunch of problems that make getting TLS certificates for local network devices difficult. Um, but I have presented a uh, proposal for a service uh, where we can uh, easily enable TLS on these devices using wildcard certs uh, and Let's Encrypt and this third-party service. So with that, I thank you for your attention, and I will take questions out in the beer garden. Oh, and it's lunch. So yeah, it's lunch, everybody. Uh, be back here at 2 o'clock uh, for Pookie Bear's talk, uh, Real Life DevSecOps. Um, uh, you can also go outside and grab a, uh, some food truck, or uh, you should have some time to go to the mainland and uh, get some food.